Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining me here today. I um, hope you're enjoying Heritage Week. Um, today, I'd like to give a talk um, about the ecology of Bordenamona Cutaway peatlands, and um, I hope you find it um, somewhat interesting. Um, I suppose, first of all, I'd like to give an overview um, of what the presentation will be about. So, um, a background to the Cutaway bog restoration currently ongoing at Board Nimona. Um, the distribution of bogs identified for restoration in County Offaly this year as part of our Peatlands Climate Action Scheme. Um, the habitats occurring on bogs, cutaway bogs generally. Um, some interesting plant species, uh, the pollinators and other invertebrates, as well as some uh, interesting bird species that we regularly encounter on the bogs. So, in summary, uh, and at a high level, um, Board Nimona have commenced this Peatlands Climate Action Scheme as part of uh, Board Nimona's Brown to Green Strategy. And this has um, managed the company's transformation into sustainable and green business. Uh, it's using our land uh, assets in a new way, um, including renewable energy, um, resource recovery, and new commercial business projects. And this is in support of the government's policy and uh, national decarbonisation commitments. So the Peatlands Climate Action Scheme, or PCAS, um, scheme involves a wide array of engineering and ecology works designed to encourage and accelerate the natural recolonisation and restoration process on cutover bogs. Um, so this is supported by government funding uh, in July 2020 um, for the announcement of the July Stimulus Plan and uh, December 2020 the further announcement of 107 million for the Peatlands Climate Action Fund, supported by further investment of, by Board Nimona for a further 18 million. So the benefits of Board Nimona's Peatland Climate Action Scheme or PCAS. Um, I'll speak today about the ecosystem services um, and largely look um, increased carbon storage, reduced carbon emissions, acceleration towards carbon sequestration. So those are the key objectives from a climate action perspective. And in terms of what carbon sequestration means, uh, it's where we're looking to take carbon from the atmosphere and capture it again within the land bank um, in the form of, of peat. Uh, material. Um, other uh, ecosystem services include its biodiversity provision, um, improved water quality, water flow attenuation, which in turn will help with flooding, and improved environmental stable landscape. Um, this will also support other um, future projects as well as amenity, and improved environment, and for local communities. So in 2021, Port um, Nimona have commenced uh, enhanced rehabilitation works on uh, 11 bogs in County Offaly, and they're listed here. As you can see, there's um, Uchter Bog, Esker, Omeris, Cave Mount, Clonad, Pula, Derries, the Tyrone uh, bogs. There's um, Mount Lucas, um, Belmont, and Bora. So they took up quite a sizable area of land, as you can see there, in relation to County Offaly. So it's a significant undertaking and will have uh, a lot of uh, benefits for biodiversity generally. The primary objective um, for uh, transitional peatland rehabilitation, traditional re peatland rehabilitation is environmental stabilization. So on the left hand side of the screen there, you can see the traditional um, milled bog, which is large areas of bare peat with um, extensive drainage and really what we'd like to do is get these bogs revegetated and um, facilitate an increased trajectory towards carbon sequestration and peat, and peat formation. So when we get into the blocking of the drains and restoring the bogs, um, generally the initial kind of uh, colonization of habitats and, and vegetation on the bogs is often this uh, soft brush dominated pore fen. 
um, on the top left corner. Um, and that that is one of the first things to come back on some of the, the drier areas of the cut over bog. In wetter areas then, however, we get um, a lot of bog cotton dominated pore fin coming in. That's in the center there with all the, the lovely white uh, flower heads. Um, they typically occur in the wetter areas and, and can often begin to establish along the, the margins of, of drains, which we can establish quite rapidly. On the drier areas, then we get this birch dominated scrub, and that will in turn eventually form into a birch dominated woodland. In some of the uh, low lying areas where water will, will gather, um, we get open water and wetlands. These can be important for a lot of wildfowl and waders in the winter, in particular but are also very good um, breeding bird sites as well for a variety of, of wetland bird species. On their margins, we get a lot of reed beds as well, which can be important for the likes of um, starlings roosting in the wintertime as well. And on prior bogs where you know, a lot of the peat mass has been taken away, we can get um, a calcareous influence or, or maybe a mineral soil influence and get a lot of dry calcareous grasslands. And they can be species rich and good for a variety of species, including vertebrates and birds and whatnot. On some of the margins of the bogs and on the drier areas, we can often get um, a dry heath type vegetation coming back um, with extensive areas of, of, of heather, uh, predominantly um, clune vulgaris, um, but also some architectural. Um, just an example of um, recent rehabilitation at Longford Pass in Littleton. So you see here in June 2019, the, the aerial image just showing the um, the amount of bare peat there occurring on site, that it's dry. And you can see these um, very um, distinctive high fields, these strips running north south. And you know, that's where we have higher fields within these lower fields in the middle. So what we've done then is put these cross berms um, connecting each of these fields in this kind of waffle effect, which um, the aim of which is to retain water at the peat surface. This in turn will facilitate the growth of sphagnum mosses and um, hopefully, hopefully put the, um, the bog on an increased trajectory towards Revegetation and, and hopefully um, carbon sequestration in the long term. So, uh, just an example here a drone image showing you know, the, the mosaic of habitats that can form within the bog. And um, top right corner, you kind of a higher, drier area. We can see the, the um, scrub starting to establish, birch and willow scrub predominantly. And then you can see the, um, the bog cotton around the margins as it's encroaching out of the wetland and some establishing reed beds and um, quite a, a lovely mosaic of habitats for a variety of wildlife. Uh, just another example, we have Terry Brat um, bog. This is the aerial image from 2000. As you can see, it's largely uh, void of vegetation. It's found in bare peat and um, you know, once uh, with time, some drain blocking, the um, you can see this significant amount of revegetation, but only small amounts of bare peat remaining. You can also see some nice wetlands that have been created here as well, central site just by some drain blocking along here, and the creation of berms again uh, between high fields that again slows or prevents the flow of water, and ultimately helps. The regeneration of the, the bog. So the target really is to get this sphagnum moss um, formation um, on deep residual peat. So we've got deep peat, but as acidic conditions, then the sphagnum moss will grow. And that really is the, the key to getting um, carbon sequestration and, and bog growth again in the future. And Again, some of the most recent work we've been doing on, for example, Castle Carbog, um, you can see the extensive area of bare peat. Um, you can see these berms that have been put right through the peatland to try and, um, again, prevent any flow of water off the bog. 
And this is working quite well. You can see the amount of water retained on the bog surface, the peat surface. And again, this extensive amount of um, peat dams put in here within the drainage network. And that's looking like it's holding back that water really well and, and creating real wet conditions on the bog. Um, Mothram bog, for example, this is the bog where there would have been um, historically some drainage done on the bog in advance of preparations for milled peat production. However, the uh, acritellum or the, the very top layer of the bog was never removed. So, um, you know, the bog is in a degraded state because it's been drained. So the primary purpose here was to get out and block these drains with um, a track machine with a broad tracks to reduce any impact on the vegetation. So you can see here, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, um, peat towns along this drain, and they're repeated again along all the other drains. And just a different view of that bog again, you can see some of the, the wider bog that wasn't drained in the past, along with this section that has been. And you can see the uh, peat towns are in place here, and they're holding back the water. You can see it's water levels come right back up in these drains here now, and the bog's getting nice and wet again. So in terms of um, the rehabilitation after use, you know, from an e ecosystem services perspective, they're of high biodiversity value for a wide variety of fauna species and, and flora. Um, we get a wide variety of interesting species like um, marsh artillery, a lot of different orchids, um, frogs and birds. So I'll go through some of those with you now just to give an example of some of the, the recent species that we've uh, reported even just this year. So some interesting plants that we get, we talked about the bog cotton, again, that's a common and widespread species that proliferates across the, the um, Cuddle Bay peatlands. And we yeah, mentioned the dry heath, all the heathers that come back as well in time. But really we're looking to get these sphagnum mosses back in here. And you can see the likes of this brown leaf sundew as well, an insectivorous plant that uh, captures um, insects um, due to it living in a nutrient poor environment. Um, we also get this lovely species here, grass of Parnassus, on some of our bogs. It's um, just a stunning species, um, and it, it's, it's not that common across our, our peatlands, but we do get it on occasion. And again, these really nice wetland areas where we get lots of um, horse tails, reed beds, and um, common spearworts, and nice galleons or bed straws, as they're called. And mix through just a really nice diverse um, ground floor. And some of the kind of more um, threatened species are those that have um, more a, a less widespread, widespread distribution in Ireland. We get um, quite commonly blue fleabane and basil thyme on the bogs, and, and these species in particular thrive on disturbed ground and uh, gravels. So we get them along our, our extensive railway network and you know, in other areas. So blue flea bane and basil thyme are both listed on the, the red uh, data book of species. Um, and basil thyme is also listed on the floor protection order, um, which gives us protection under the Irish Wildlife Act. Um, brown leaf wintergreen as well, another unusual species that we get on the bogs, but um, you know, the restricted distribution in Ireland. It's quite lovely um, white flowers here in summer, and then it is evergreen, so you can get, get the um, leaves right throughout the winter. And we've been lucky enough to add another record for County Offaly recently as well. Um, so that's is interesting given its um, restricted distribution. Where we tend to find um, round leaf wintergreen on the good over uh, tends to be on this kind of um, re-establishing um, vegetation in where you get this kind of element of birch and willow scrub. Um, so, you know, it's worth keeping an eye out for those species if you're out on the bog. Um, but then, you know, the other habitats that we have, um, like the drier grasslands that occur along the railways and the margins of the bogs um, are great for pollinators. You get a wide diversity of a floral species, which in turn support pollinators and, and other insects. And we get lots of orchids as well coming up along with those, given some of the calcareous influences as well uh, from some of the fill material. And then out on the um, revegetating bog, 
at the right time of year, you can see lots of color on the bogs like this uh, red asphodel, um, which is a stunning species and um, not only adds color to the bog, but is, is great for pollinators. And this is just an example of some of the um, butterfly species recorded just recently on the bogs from our days out doing certain survey work. So we've got uh, top left corner, we've got a uh, common blue, we've got uh, orange tip butterfly, uh, marsh artillery, um, small tortoise shell, large heath, which again is, is not that common, um, some green hair streak and, and ringlet. Um, we do get a lot of other species, but this is just some of the ones that we've been lucky enough to recently photograph and report on site. Um, given that the bog is the wetland and we get lots of, of water courses on site and, and wetlands, then this attracts a lot of um, dragonflies and tamsoflies. And um, this is an example of some of the species that we've encountered recently, like um, the common hawker there in the middle, the common darter, large red tamsofly, um, and this hydro blue tamsofly. We also get common blues and uh, blue tail tamsoflies. Um, and these are not just um, nice and pretty to observe during the summer months, but they spend most of their lives in the, in the nymph form underwater, and they in turn become an important part of the, uh, the food web. So we just look at marsh tillery here for a moment. Um, again, partly because it's Ireland's only protected insect. It's um, listed in Annex 2 of the EU Habitats Directive and its status is vulnerable. Um, we do record them quite regularly across a lot of our bogs, given the fact that we do have a lot of their food plant, the devil's bit scabious, Society of Pretensis. So um, when we're out surveying for them, we look for this um, lovely blue, purpley colour, um, which indicates the presence of the devil's bit scabious. And then the right time of the year, which is now um, mid-August, right through the early October, we can look for the, the larvae um, of, of the butterflies. So you can see them here, an example of them feeding on the leaves of Telespit scabious, and they create this nice little web in which they can protect themselves as they're, um, as they're feeding and they gradually move and creep along these leaves. So then next spring, they'll come out and they'll pupate and eventually emerge as the adult again to complete the cycle. So um, breeding birds and wintering birds, we get a lot of different wildfowl and waders. This is an example of some of the wader species that we've been lucky to record breeding and wintering on the site. sites. Um, in terms of breeding, we get common sandpiper on some of the bogs, ringed plover, um, red shank, snipe, and lapwing, to name a few of the common ones. And um, again, hooper swan, um, we get them in quite large numbers on some of the peatlands particularly those where you've got extensive areas of open water. Uh, in the 2009-2010 winter Hooper Swan Survey, there was a record of 950 swans, uh, which would um, be of international importance. And again, they're listed in Annex 1 of the EU Birds Directive, so they're protected species, and we're cognizant of them when undertaking our activities on the bogs during the winter months. So the Drina wetlands, is a fantastic um, area for uh, wildfowl and waders and uh, both the breeding and wintering season. You can see the extent of um, large open water bodies, as, as well as having these nice small pools and a mosaic with scrub and other more open habitats. Nice little islands that provide protection for the likes of breeding black-headed gulls and other waders. Um, that drone footage was taken just earlier this summer. So um, just an example of where the site is. So it's located here in County Offaly. The Boer Parklands is um, located out here to the uh, east. This is uh, Terry Branch. And then further west, we have this area here, which is the, um, the drying of wetlands. So when we're undertaking some survey work, and sometimes we've been lucky to come across some nesting lapwing. So you can see how difficult it is to record their nests, um, they're quite minimal. And um, if you take a look here, you can actually see the nest is just here. Um, 
in the bottom foreground. And they're quite minimal, so they're easy to be overlooked. And um, but I suppose it's part of their strategy. So recently we've also been lucky enough to have um, the Eurasian crane or something called a common crane um, begin to breed or attempt to breed on our Bordnamona sites. So they had two failed attempts in the last two years. And this year, uh, 2021, was the first year in which they had um, successfully hatched two chicks. So this created a great stir. And um, as you may have seen on social media, it's been widely reported. Uh, unfortunately, one of the chicks um, hadn't been seen again after its first sighting. So we presumed that it was lost to most likely predation. Um, the second chick then developed quite well, and it was observed again into late June, um, where it was quite large, but unfortunately hasn't been seen since. Now, um, it could be again that it's got predated or, or something had happened to it because it hasn't been observed with the adult pair. Um, but however, it's a sign that the birds are getting better at being adults and uh, rearing young successfully. Um, and hopefully they'll continue to, to hold territory and, and be successful again next year. So just an example of them again in flight over one of the bogs this year. And um, just a tip, sometimes they can be confused with the more common grey heron, which we get right across the country, which is a lot smaller. And in flight, the grey heron actually had a kink in the neck um, here, so they hold their, their head right in close to chest when in flight, unlike the, the Eurasian crane. So we look forward to, to seeing their progress next year again, and, and hopefully they have more success. Um, in terms of other rare or uncommon birds that we, we've been lucky to record on the bottles or in recent years, um, they're particularly important. The, um, the peatlands for wintering hen harrier, they, they roost in, in decent numbers on the bogs. They also quarter or, or hunt uh, during the winter months um, around the bog and can often be quite easily seen uh, in and around the, the Boer parklands. Um, they're a fantastic speech, species to see, and I'd highly recommend you get out and have a look if, if in the Boer parklands area. Um, wind chat, we've re recorded them successfully breeding on one of our bogs recently, this, this just this year. And um, you can see the, um, the adult here photographed on the bog this year and uh, a juvenile recorded nearby. So that's that's very nice to have them and breeding on a recently revegetated um, cut of a bog, cut away a bog. And the Eurasian curlew, um, you know, a familiar sound not that many years ago, but now in, in steep decline. And some of our bogs have been important sites for breeding curlew. So we endeavour to protect them and incorporate them into our um, our operations, and you know hopefully some of these sites will continue to be successful and continue to rear um, curlew um, into the future. So again, as I mentioned earlier, I highly recommend you visit the uh, Lockport Visitors Centre, the Discovery Park. It's uh, got great resources there, parking facilities, and um, it's an extensive cycleway there as well and walkways. So um, it's a great place at any time of the year, uh, whether it's during the summer when you got a lot of breeding black-headed gulls and other species there, um, and even the winter when you get a lot of wintry wildfowl um, beginning to gather and congregate there for the winter months. So thank you very much for uh, logging on to join our presentation. I hope it has of some interest and provided a, a brief overview of the um, value of our peatlands and um, some of the works that are ongoing at Bordemona to help rehabilitate the bogs. Thank you very much.